Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. I know this is a little unconventional for a recital hour, but since it is tax season, and maybe some of you are seeing the advertisements on TV for various tax services, maybe some of you are even in the process of preparing your taxes or having them prepared right now, I think that this would be an, an interesting topic to at least take a little bit of time to uh, discuss. So uh, just, just as a question, how many of you want to be music teachers? How many of you want to be performers? How many of you want to go into music ministry? Okay, okay, cool. How many of you have some other plan, maybe music business, maybe something outside of music? Anybody? Okay, cool. Well, <laughs> regardless of what your plans are, there's one thing, or one of the things all of those have in common is taxes. We all have to pay taxes. And being involved in music, I think it's important, at least as a student right now, to start thinking about some business aspects that are, that are going to affect you, regardless of what particular field of music you choose to go into. How taxes work. So, so let's just jump in right here. I think we all probably have different uh, levels of knowledge when it comes to taxes. Some of you may have paid taxes before. Some of you just may think of taxes as this big scary word that's going to come up eventually someday. So basically the way taxes work, just from a ground level perspective, we all are part of a society. We all live in within a country. And that country, that, that society needs things, right? We need paved roads. We need traffic lights that work. We need a fire department. One of the ways that our government pays for those things is through taxes. There are different forms of taxes. There are property taxes. There are sales taxes. And the type of taxes we're going to be speaking about specifically as they relate to you are your income taxes. So for every dollar you make, the government gets to take so many cents of that dollar. Basically, that's how taxes work. If you're a beginning teacher, say a beginning band director or choir director, making, say, about $35,000 per year, you fall within about a 13% tax bracket, which basically means for every dollar you make, the government takes 13 cents of it. So you can do the math and figure out over the year how much tax that you will have to owe. Now, the more money you make, the more taxes you owe. But there are ways in order to lessen the amount of tax you owe by determining money that can be subtracted from that taxable amount. And we call those things deductions. And if you watch a lot of the television commercials right now, you'll see people that can get, they claim to get you the maximum tax refund possible. And basically what they're talking about is finding all of the tax deductions. So of course, we all want to make as much money as possible. But come tax time, we want the amount that we can be taxed on to be as small as possible. Basically, what that means, what we're going to be talking about, is the money that you spend out of pocket to make your money, you don't have to be taxed on. And we call those things deductions. Moving along, what you will need, let's go over four basic forms. I find when doing my own taxes and advising anybody that has questions on taxes, that I use four basic forms. Uh, the one general one is the uh, form 10, 1040, which is what you're going to put the majority of your information on. It's important if you're doing deductions to get the 1040 and not a variation on it like the 1040A or 1040EZ, but the 1040. Um, your Schedule A for what we're going to refer to as your itemized deductions. If you're making outside money, which hopefully all of you will, if you are in music, you have a chance to be an entrepreneur. Who can tell me what that word means? What's an entrepreneur? Does anybody know? They have their own business. Somebody who is in charge of coordinating their own income. You're in charge of the factors of your own production. In our society, that's a powerful thing. Part of what we refer to of, as the American dream is largely built on this theory of entrepreneurship. So that's very important. Hopefully, you'll be also making additional money outside of your your day-to-day full-time job allowing you to be an entrepreneur. And lastly, if you do file a Schedule C, we'll talk about lastly your self-employment tax. So two sources of income in terms of deciding how much income you're going to put down and what you're going to deduct from each type of income, I like to divide it into two separate sources. One, your W-2 and 1099 income. And what that is, your W-2 income, is any regular work that you have. 
could be your full-time job if you're a teacher or even as a student, say, if you worked at a restaurant this, this year and it's some kind of recurring regular paycheck, you will get a W-2. If you have work outside of that where you made over $600, that employer is required to send you what's referred to as a 1099 form. And both of these things get mailed to you, usually either in late January or early February. In addition to that, your other income. And for most of us, say if we're teaching during the day, we have opportunities maybe to play gigs on weekends, teach some private students, maybe do some band camps, do some choir camps, do a variety of outside things. That's what we're going to refer to as our other income. And that's going to be recorded on your Schedule C. So it's important as you go th throughout the year to keep track of those things. For me, personally, I find it easy just to have an envelope on the kitchen counter. When I go out and I play a gig somewhere or I teach a, a private student outside of my teaching responsibilities here, on the envelope, I just write down the amount, the date, and, and kind of a description of, of what that type of income was. If it was a private student or a jazz gig, that type of information. Okay, so we try to make as much money as possible, right? We're trying to make as much money during the year. Then when it comes tax time, we want to make that money look small. So that way, when the tax man comes and wants to get, say, their 13 or 15 cents on that dollar, we have as few of those dollars as possible. So now, our deductions specifically for your W-2 and 1099 are going to be what's on referred to as your Schedule A form. You can find all of these forms on irs.gov. If you're using a program like uh, TurboTax, those, those forms will be readily available <coughs> there. Um, and it's going to ask you for some, some different pieces of information. Specifically, what we're going to talk about here, the important stuff because we don't have a whole lot of time, is line 21, which is your unreimbursed employee expenses. Basically, anything out of pocket that you had to pay in order to make that money. Okay, the money that you made on your W-2 or any 1099s that, that you get, anything you had to pay out of pocket. And I like to think about that in four broad categories, your travel, your meals, materials, and memberships. Your travel, so for example, if you get asked to go teach a band camp, or say you get asked to maybe help out with a marching band in Louisville during the fall, and you made $1,000 or maybe $600 doing that, and they send you a 1099, you obviously had to put your own gas money into going and making the money from that, that uh, band camp, from that teaching. So there's two different ways to do this. You can either use your gas receipts, the actual money that you paid, or you can use a standard mileage deduction that the IRS um, allows you to. And usually the standard deduction is about 55 cents. And if you do the math, generally, unless you're driving a Sherman tank to all of your gigs, the standard deduction is gonna work out to be more. For example, I drive a Honda Civic, I can fill that up right now for like 35 bucks, okay? But if I take the amount of miles that I drive to a gig and I multiply it by that 55 cents, that's a much bigger number. So you can use either one. You can either use which one is higher. Same thing's true with your meals. Say if you have to go judge a contest down in Jackson and you have to eat food, obviously. You're going there in the morning, you're going to be there during the day, you drive back late at night. In order for you to do that job, you need food, just like your car needs fuel, your body needs fuel, right? That's a, a normal ex expense as part of making that income. You can do that also two ways. You can save up all of your receipts, or you can take the standard per diem that the government allows you. You can look up the uh, specific state or city that you're working in at gsa.gov. It'll tell you. Um, Towns or cities that have higher uh, cost of living, the amounts will be higher. Uh, places that are not as expensive, the cost will be lower. If, if the city you're working in isn't listed on there, I think the general amount is like $39. Again, as long as you're not really going overboard with your food expenses, you're probably, or hopefully not, spending over $39 uh, per day on food. So again, that might work in your benefit. Your materials, your instruments, your instrument 
upkeep, any music you have to buy, any recording, say if you're getting ready for a gig, you get called up by the Tupelo Symphony and they're doing Beethoven Symphony 5 and you really need a recording so you can learn your part well. When you buy that, you buy it on iTunes, you can use that as one of your expenses as well. Um, a big one is finale. If you're arranging music, say for your school choir or your church choir or your band or anything like that, you obviously need that program to do that work. And finale, as we all know, is expensive. And even with the upgrade each year, that's at least, what, like a hundred bucks or something. You can deduct that because that's a cost of doing business. You would not be able to make that money unless you bought finale. Okay, and lastly, memberships. Uh, big ones are uh, MENC. Um, Percussive Art Society, International Trumpet Guild, I'm sure for each, uh, each type of instrumentation or type of genre there, there's a, a professional society which, which is definitely a benefit to be a part of. If you teach in a part of, of the, the country that requires you to be in a teacher's uh, union, you can deduct your union dues. Okay, So be, be sure to keep track of anything that you have to spend out of pocket in order to make this money. Okay, so that's all of your W-2 and your 1099 income. Now your other income, right? All the private lessons, all of the gigs on the weekends. As your career develops and you meet and network with more people, these opportunities will grow and grow. You'll get more emails, you'll get more phone calls. And what you want to do is keep track of, of these things. And on the Schedule C, this is where you report all of this income. The first part is your income. And the code that I like to use as kind of a catch-all for my, all, all of my activities is independent artists, writers, and performers, which is 711510. If you're doing something else, um, you can obviously look up in their index there of, of the different types of uh, professional activities. And take all that money that you've added up all throughout the year, and again, as, as I said, I like to uh, keep an envelope at, at my house for very conveniently. I can, I can keep a list of that. I would encourage you to do so as well. <clears throat> the next part is your expenses. And all the stuff that we talked about with your Schedule A pertains. And in addition, a couple of extra things as well. Your insurance for your instruments. If you buy an instrument, I encourage you to buy insurance for it. Um, a company that I use is Clarion Insurance. Their phone number is very easy to remember, 1-800-Vivaldi. Uh, so if you call them up or if you go online, sometimes being a member of a different, uh, various professional organizations, they'll offer you a discount from Clarion. For example, I'm a member of Percussive Arts Society. And if you're a member of PS, you can get a discount on your Clarion instrument in insurance. I try to have all of my uh, expensive instruments at least insured through them. I'd encourage you as well too. Second one is depreciation, which is really isn't as widely known. But basically what that means is that this isn't something that's just specific to music or to instruments, but for any piece of equipment. And, and just, just to kind of give an example, say a business buys a, a, uh, a laptop. Say they buy a MacBook and it costs them about $1,000. Now, 10 years from now, is that laptop going to be worth $1,000? No, right? For a bunch of reasons. For wear and tear, because there's new technologies always coming out, right? So what, what that is called is depreciation. It goes down in value. And you can deduct off each year the amount of depreciation. And this isn't something that's just specific to equipment like that. It can also apply to your instruments as, as well, too. And Probably the easiest method of doing that is what's called a 10-year straight line depreciation, where you take an instrument, say, um, I bought a marimba a number of years back, cost me about $10,000, okay? So if I divide that by 10, I can deduct off $1,000 each year. Now you multiply 1,000 by, say, 15 or 13%, that's how much money I don't have to pay in taxes. That's that much more money in my pocket, okay? Now, of course, our instruments don't always depreciate. Sometimes they actually go up in value, but at least how the IRS sees it in terms of our equipment depreciating or having less value, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure if, if you didn't do maintenance on your equipment, for example, on my drums, if I didn't 
change the heads and maintain the, the uh, hardware, yeah, it will go down in, in, in time. And certainly I wouldn't pay as much for a used drum set as I was for a brand new right out of the box drum set. So that's something else to think about. Your insurance and your depreciation in addition to the, the other expenses you would write down on your Schedule A. And if you file a Schedule C, which we just talked about, you are required to file a Schedule SE, which is a self-employment tax. I won't get too into this right now. I found out about this because I didn't know you had to file one. And the IRS is very good about getting back in touch with you very quickly <laughs> and telling you this is what you need to do. And they'll even send you the form. And they'll tell you when they need it by. And they'll tell you what will happen if you don't do it. Right? <laughs> Basically what that means is you take the amount you're paying or the amount you've made and you have to pay an additional tax on that. They are a little bit nicer about it. You actually multiply it by 92%. So they're, they're saving you a little bit. You only have to pay taxes on 92% of it. Um, and in the end, you can actually deduct off part of the amount of what you're paying in self-employment tax off of your taxable income. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Okay? So, kind of wrapping things up here, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time and you guys have ensembles and classes and whatnot to, to get to. Just some general ad advice. Don't forget about your state income taxes. If you move to a different state, they may have a different state income tax. Case in point, I lived in Texas for three years before I, I came here. And I think it was on, on tax day. I got my federal taxes done. I was over in Music Building A. I was all proud of myself. I was talking to a colleague like, hey, guess what? I got my taxes done. I did them all by myself. Look at me. I'm so smart. They're like, yeah, you, know, you did the federal. You know, how did things work out for you on the, the uh, state taxes? What? Right? And so I had to like literally like go to the post office like that day and like pull all the forms out and uh, do them right there. So some states like Texas and some others don't have a state income tax. Some places the forms are different. I know in Mississippi you can actually use your Schedule C from the federal level and just use that in your state taxes. The, the Schedule A is a little bit different. In fact, it's a little bit easier to do in, in uh, Mississippi. But that's something to be aware of. Document everything, right? So the amount, the expenses, all of that in case the IRS comes back and asks you, where did you get this expense from? Where did this income come from? If you know where it came from and you have a record of it, even if it's just having it in, in your uh, 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 date book, that's, that's a good um, documentation of that. Be honest, right? This is a big one, um, especially when it comes to your Schedule C income, right? You know, as your, your entrepreneurship build, you get more and more gigs. You get asked to do band camps. You get asked to do adjudication, clinics. You're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That money is getting bigger and bigger. What else is getting bigger? Your taxes. So you're sitting there. At, at your dining room table in March, and you just start, the numbers starting to come to you, and you're like, wait a minute. What if I just didn't tell them about this money I made? I mean, nobody's gonna know, right? You know? Um, that's not exactly true. If it touches your bank account, you know, unless you just cash the check, you're just being like constantly paid in cash only, I suppose you won't get caught. Um, if you do get caught, the, the penalties are very, very high. And we're all part of a society, and uh, regardless of what your political views are regarding uh, taxation, it's all that it's really important that we all play by the same <coughs> rules. So be honest. Um, if in doubt, ask. I think the biggest problem people get themselves into with money is that they get they get overwhelmed, and they think it's this big confusing thing that they can't possibly um, understand. So that's why when people get famous, they turn their money over to somebody else and they, 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 they do all this work and release all these CDs and they find out 10 years later that they don't have a dime of it, right? Or we don't do our taxes on time because we're afraid of, we think the IRS is like this, uh, this scary uh, goon squad that's out there, right? And 
most of the time, or prac all of the time, if you have a question, you can call them up. They have a, a chat forum online. You can ask a question, right? So if in doubt, ask a question. They will be more than happy to answer it. Why? Because they're not out to get you. In fact, they want you to do your job correctly because it makes their job easier, right? And so if in doubt, ask. The information <coughs> is online. Go to irs.gov. You can look up all the forms. And if, you, if it's still confusing, they have resources on, on there. Even if you're having somebody else do your taxes for you, it's still your money, right? And it's important to at least have a shared vocabulary with anybody that's handling your money, okay? And that ties back into the more resourceful you are and the more engaged you are in your business and in your money, that's gonna help you be a better entrepreneur. Okay, I thank you guys for your time and have a good afternoon.